This is the CBS Sunday Night News. Susan Spencer reporting. Good evening. The evangelical world was shocked today by the tearful confession of one of its leading TV preachers, Jimmy Swaggart, that he had sinned against God and family. This amid reports of a church investigation involving photographs of Swaggart with a prostitute. Bruce Hall reports. In a charged atmosphere, worldwide television evangelist Jimmy Swaggart stood before his home congregation, confessing to sexual sins, saying he must temporarily step down from the pulpit. I do not plan in any way to whitewash my sin. I do not call it a mistake, a mendacity. I call it sin. In a highly emotional moment, Jesus the fundamentalist Christ. preacher turned and talked directly to his wife, Frances. I have sinned against you. And I beg your forgiveness. And then he asked for forgiveness from his son, Donnie, and his daughter-in-law, and from the standing room crowd of more than 7,000. The congregation the wept openly and gave him a standing passion. ovation. Yes, the ministry will continue. <laughs> While the multi-million dollar worldwide ministry goes on, Jimmy Swaggart is putting his future in the hands of the National Assemblies of God Church. It is expected church leaders will set up a program for Swaggart's restoration, a period of penance that could take months. I have sinned against you, my Lord. And I would ask that your precious blood would wash and cleanse every stain. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Baton Rouge. Presidential candidate and former television evangelist Pat Robertson today put distance between himself and Swaggart. When asked about the possible political impact of this latest scandal, Robertson said he just not thought about it. Good progress. That was the way Secretary of State Schultz and Soviet Foreign Minister Shevardnadze described their first meeting in Moscow today. But as Wyatt Andrews reports, the hard work still lies ahead. Secretary of State Schultz will conclude his Moscow visit in critical meetings with both Foreign Minister Shevardnadze and Soviet leader Gorbachev. On the table are the widest array of issues ever discussed with the Soviets during the Reagan administration. Before he leaves Moscow, Schultz will find out where the Soviets stand on how to solve the crisis in the occupied territory, and whether the Soviets, despite persistent refusals, might be willing to recognize the state of Israel in exchange for a role in any Middle East conference. On Afghanistan, Schultz will press the Soviets to help form a coalition government in Kabul, a government that would include Mujahideen forces and which would keep the peace while the Soviets quickly withdraw their troops. Both sides on Sunday claimed that a treaty to cut long-range nuclear missiles in half was still possible and might be ready by the time President Reagan travels to Moscow late this spring. Despite that optimistic outlook, however, neither side was ready to claim a breakthrough on the tough issues of Star Wars testing and how to verify this kind of treaty. Officials describe the atmosphere of Sunday's talks as excellent. Wyatt Andrews, CBS News, with the Secretary of State in Moscow. Secretary Schultz's efforts on the diplomatic front, important as they are, aren't making nearly the splash in Moscow, as is another American project. As John Shan reports, it's stealing the show. It's the first time there's ever been an American film festival in Russia. And though there has been no advertising, the way word of mouth functions in the Soviet Union, capacity crowds have lined up for every performance so far. More than 30 old and new movies are being shown in Moscow and Leningrad. In addition to seeing the films, some of the Soviet audiences have the opportunity to talk with the movie makers and the stars. Steve Martin. After a performance of Roxanne, the Soviet audience was as interested in Daryl Hannah's education and personal life as they were in her film. Most Russians know the story of Cyrano de Bergerac. They fell in love with Steve Martin. This woman found it very modern compared with the movies she's used to seeing. After a screening of An Officer and a Gentleman, this Soviet policeman called it a good-natured comedy and said, please bring us more films from America. John Shea, CBS News, Moscow.
Still ahead on the CBS Sunday Night News, the U.S. Olympic hockey team skating for gold or out in the cold. Two more Arabs were shot to death today on the West Bank, and Palestinians there kicked off a series of protests against a visit to Israel this week by Secretary of State Schultz. Bob Simon is following de developments. While the daily riot was being enacted in Ramallah, preparations for the Schultz visit were being made all over the territories. U.S. officials were trying to convince some local Palestinian leaders to meet with the secretary, but the PLO repeated today that this would not be possible because the U.S. initiative, it said, is aimed at putting down the Palestinian uprising. In Jerusalem, more police reinforcements arrived. One observer remarked, there haven't been so many guards in town since the Romans pulled out 1,300 years ago. In Nablus today, soldiers tried to contain the violence with a new wall to block off the Kasbah. And in the hills above Ramallah, a young man shot in the chest was making his last slow, secretive journey home. His friend snatched him from the now overcrowded hospital before the soldiers could take his body away. The army usually buries the victims at night with just one or two family members present. The army is afraid of large gatherings of Palestinians. The army will be particularly vigilant while Schultz is here. Meanwhile, the Palestinians seem determined to keep the heat on while Schultz is here, afraid that if they turn it off now, there will be nothing left to fire the negotiations. Bob Simon, CBS News, Tel Aviv. Another bill to aid the Nicaraguan rebels is up for debate in the House this week. The Democrats wrote it, and unlike the Reagan plan rejected three weeks ago, this one contains no military aid. Deborah Potter reports. The Democrats are proposing a $25 million package of purely humanitarian aid. The money would keep the Contras in food, medicine, clothing, and shelter for the next four months. A major part of the plan is a so-called Children's Survival Fund to care for young victims on both sides of the war in Nicaragua. It moves towards helping children who have been afflicted with the conflict. It moves in, in terms of providing the sustenance for those forces who need to negotiate at the table. The package already is under fire. Liberals like Les O'Coin, who have always opposed Contra aid, are urging their colleagues to vote no unless the aid goes through a neutral third party after a cessation of hostilities. And many Republicans who support the Contras don't like the package either. If it just furthers a surrender or a uh, uh, moving of the Contras out of Nicaragua into refugee camps, you know, we're, we're not inclined to support that. Even if the package is approved by the House, it faces another bumpy ride in the Senate, where efforts are expected once again to add military aid for the Contras to the House package. Deborah Potter, CBS News, on Capitol Hill. The U.S. hockey team's hopes for an Olympic medal were on the line tonight in Calgary. Mark Phillips is there. The U.S. hockey team in the dressing room before tonight's game, knowing it not only had to win, but win by two goals. Or this opening face-off would be their last of this Olympics. It did not start well. The West Germans, also fighting for a place in the medal round, held the Americans off in their end and up the ante at the other. A couple of nice plays and some sloppy goaltending nice later, and the Americans were down by two Save on the night. Rebound, he puts it in. Faced now with having to score four goals to survive, the Americans came close in the second period, but not close enough. Time and the chance of another hockey miracle were slipping away. Another German goal made things more desperate. An American reply by Scott Fusco offered a ray of hope, as did a double penalty to the Germans, part of it for illegal equipment. But nothing helped, not even pulling the goalie. A 4-1 West German win knocked the U.S. out of the running. A game team of college stars not up to the demands of contemporary Olympic hockey. Mark Phillips, CBS News, Calgary. Sometimes what bubbles up and seems new to one generation isn't new at all. It just has a sparkling new audience. Take, for example, seltzer. Charles Osgood reports on the new craze for the old fizz. My name is Jerry Malwaney. I'm a seltzer man. I deliver seltzer and soda to homes. You can still find them in New York City. Seltzer. But seltzer men are a threatened species. We're a dying breed. And the demand is less, so it is less and less of us. For many of the customers of the seltzer man, the colorful antique bottles are the stuff of nostalgia. Two cents plain and all that. It reminds me of when I used to come to visit my grandparents in Brooklyn. 
and we'd sit at the corner shop and uh, there'd be a bottle of seltzer water and uh, we'd make our own egg creams. There was no egg and no cream in an egg cream, by the way. And here in Brooklyn today, whether the old-fashioned bottles are green or blue, there's nothing in them but water and a charge of carbon dioxide to give it the spritz. But times do change, of course. And who would have thought that the big, fashionable, hotsy totsy drink of the 1980s would turn out to be seltzer water? Seltzer sales are absolutely effervescent. They've bubbled up to $260 million last year, and this year, double that. Seltzer is so trendy that in some cities, you'll now find fancy watering holes specializing in water, of all things. The newest is Club Soda in Atlanta. Big joke at the Club Soda. What do wimps drink? Answer, Perrier Light. Charles Osgood, CBS News, New York. And that is the CBS Sunday Night News. I'm Susan Spencer in New York. Have a good week. This is CBS.